hard to believe it's been 20 years. I mean, I remember the day that all of this started. I remember, I mean, we covered it. And, and I remember exactly where I was when they found you. And I, I am just, to see how your life has evolved since that time, has been remarkable to me and to everybody. And now here you are uh, on, uh, you have been doing great good ever since. How do, you, how do you account for that? I mean, how, how do you, how does someone who went through what you went through get to that point where you use it as if it was emotional Judo, you know, judo is where, where you use your opponent's momentum against them, right? How did you do this? How did you do this? <clears throat> well, I, first of all, kidnapping and rape and sexual violence, I think they make you feel like you're the only one who's ever gone through that. that and it feels very shameful and it feels like a dirty secret that you don't want anyone to know about and that's certainly how I felt and when I got home I wanted more than anything just to go back to being who I was before I was kidnapped I wanted I wanted to be me I wanted my old life back and it was a process and it took me a while to recognize that I will never be who I was before all this happened that will never happen that person is gone and um, I needed to learn to be okay with my new life and that was, you know, that took time and that, I mean, it didn't just happen overnight. But my dad was very involved in advocacy and little by little he'd ask me, what do you think about this? What do you think about the Amber Alert? Have you ever heard of the Amber Alert? Do you know what it is? Let me explain it to you. And little by little he'd talk to me about things and he'd invite me, he'd ask me, you know, do you want to come with me? Do you want to say something about this? Or, you know, do you feel like it's effective? And, and so little by little I started doing more and more. And as I did more, I met more people and it was really shocking to me when I began to realize that actually what I went through is not so different and it's not so uncommon to what thousands of other people experience all the time. And as I began to uh, have that understanding and realization come to me, I began to feel like, well, I can, like, I have a support network and my family does believe me. They're not divided thinking, oh, she's making this up, she's looking for attention, or I know that person, they'd never do that. Like, everyone has always, maybe not everyone, but most people have always believed me. And I think that made a huge difference for me. And as I met these other survivors and I uh, knew where I was in my journey and I was able to get kind of a vague idea of where these other survivors were, I thought, I can do something about this. And why, why shouldn't I? Like, there's not a reason for me not to. So I went through it and it was terrible, but now I have an opportunity to do something about it and hopefully prevent other people from being kidnapped and hopefully prevent other people from being raped and sexually exploited. And that's kind of how it all started. I, I remember your mother, and you've uh, said this to many other interviewers, but it was your mother, Lois, who told you, you know, he's stolen nine months, at the very least, stolen nine months of your life from you. Don't you give him another minute? Well, when you're 14 years old, you know, did that sink in at that time? Or did, or did it take you some time to really come to understand what she meant? And, and get to that point where you could be proactive. Well, she said it, I think her timing had a lot to do with everything, because she said it, I mean, it was the morning after I was rescued. It was, I mean, just right there, and I was still caught up in, honestly, the euphoria of being at home, the relief of being reunited with my family, and, and being safe, and knowing that no one's gonna be able to hurt me, and. I mean, I was filled with all of these positive emotions. So when she at first said that to me, I was just like, 
well, of course, like, why would I be sad? Everything that was taken away from me was just given back. I mean, are you kidding me? I just missed my freshman year of high school. I'm not going to miss anything else. I had some serious fear of missing out uh, on everything moving forward. And so when she said that to me, and at first my reaction was like, why are you telling me this? Of course I'm not going to. Of course I'm, of course I'm not going to. Of course I'm going to be happy. Um, but I mean, her words, as they usually do, uh, tended to stay with me. And then, you know, there were times when there I was hard, when it was hard, when I was frustrated. I mean, the, the trial, the court case, the proceedings, I mean, they were very frustrating. I mean, it made me very angry thinking, why is, he, why is this not done yet? You know, it's five years, it's six years, seven years, eight years. How is this still not done? Um, and my mom growing up, I mean, she'd always, whenever I had a bad day, she'd be like, Elizabeth, you know, what do you do when a horse bucks you off? And I hated that so much. Oh, I hate it. I was like, why? just why let me feel sorry for myself for five why, minutes. Why did you hate it? So it, it did your Because she always wanted me to get back up. She always wanted me to keep going. That's the way, whole, way my whole life was. And now as an adult, um, I am so appreciative of that because, she, because I always, no matter how low I sunk, I still got back up and kept going because that's what I had been raised to do. And that's how I'm here. But you must have felt at some point when she's trying to encourage you that way, look, mom, you have no idea what I went through. Okay. Everybody think that sometimes? Well, I, sure, we all think that. But I mean, you're in a kind of an exclusive club here. I mean, if you can call it a club, for heaven's sakes. And I mean, none of us, none of us, as best as you could describe it in words, in your book, in interviews and other ways, none of us could ever conceive of what you went through and what it did to you as a person. And, and now where you are, I mean, that is what is so amazing to all the rest of us, is that you went from being this innocent 14-year-old girl to experiencing this incredible, traumatic, awful, terrible situation. I mean, there aren't enough adjectives to describe what it was you went through to now, on the other side of this, blessing the lives and potentially blessing the lives of millions of people. I mean, how do you reconcile that? How, how did you, that's why I ask, how on earth did you do this? Well, yeah, was it bad? Yeah, it was terrible. It was awful. It was hell, pure hell. But, I mean, it had an ending. I mean, it ended. And I think that my, desire to live and my my want to have happiness and and to do good in the world outweighed my trauma my nightmares my my fears i think it just everything that i wanted outweighed what had happened i guess i guess this work that you're involved in now is has to be cathartic in some way in in terms of, uh, because it's hard, it's hard for I me, mean, we all get involved in good causes, you know, we all have our pet causes we want to be involved in, but none of us are motivated to those causes by something like what you went through. Uh, and so that's why I, I, I marvel at you saying that it compensates for the terrible thing that you went through being able to do this good. Help me understand how that balances out in your heart. Um, I mean, it, it's, been a, it's been a process because when I first got home, I, I think I swore up and down that I was never going to write a book. I'd never do a movie or a documentary. I didn't want to do any media. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I didn't want to see anyone. Um, isn't that ironic now? <laughs> yeah, well. But there was a lot of shame and a lot of, for no reason, guilt associated to everything that happened. And so it took time to let that go because even though, like, logically I could reason it out in my mind and be like, nothing that happened was my fault. I didn't do anything wrong. 
Um, I could logically go through that, but being able to logically do that and emotionally be on the same page, I mean, that was different. It took time. It took a while for my emotions to catch up to a point where I could really say that, you know, these feelings of, of guilt or shame or, or, you know, sadness or pain, um, they don't get in my way anymore. And I could go back into these kinds of topics without them resurfacing. It took a while for that to happen. It didn't just happen overnight. I mean, it's, it's 20 years now. So it's, yeah, it's been a long time. You're effectively changing the definition of who you are. I mean, it, it, I don't know how anybody could avoid it. Somebody who had gone through what you went through, it would define them. And what you've been able to do is change that definition. And now, the work that you're involved in, help me to understand how much good you think you can do where you are. Well, when it was just me, I felt limited. I really did. But early the, earlier this year, uh, my foundation joined forces with the Maloof Foundation, and now I feel like, like the future is unlimited if you will. Um, you know, I did not study nonprofit in school. I did not study business administration. I didn't study tax law or anything else that might be useful in this uh, kind of line of work and running a nonprofit. I didn't study any of that. I studied music performance. I mean. You still play on the harp? Um, my kids mostly see it as a big jungle gym, so <laughs> it's a little bit is expensive. It it's is a little it's bit expensive for them to climb on, right. so it's... Is it still tuned? Do you uh, tune it? <laughs> a few times a year. Yeah, okay, all right. But there is a famous saying among harpists that you spend half your time tuning your harp and the other half of the time playing out of tune, <laughs> which is true, so... <laughs> But um, no, so now where I'm at, where I've been able to merge with the Malou Foundation, I feel so much more possibility is ahead because we're working together and I feel like more people can always do more together than just one person on their own. So, so be specific about what, what the, the two foundations will be able to accomplish together that you were not able to do when you were apart. Well, I mean, there's just, there's so much, as I mentioned, I didn't study business or nonprofit or anything. So honestly, it was me trying to figure out how things, I was trying to learn it, I was trying to do it. And honestly, I'm not, I'm not a business person. Um, I don't know administration. I don't know all of the back stuff. I just know that I have a passion for good. And so joining with Maloof has been so incredible because now I get to do what I want. I mean, I'm able to bring up the issues that are important to me. For example, um, just this past April, we, uh, it was Maloof's second uh, summit, anti-sexual exploitation summit. But I was able to be involved in that and I was able to help plan it and I was able to say, I think this person would be absolutely amazing to come in and speak on this topic. For instance, um, I invited JC Dugard, I invited Dr. Rebecca Bailey to come out and we were able to sit down and have a panel, have a discussion on the difference between what Stockholm Syndrome is and what appeasement is because most people have heard of fight or flight and freeze, but how many people have actually heard of appease? And that is actually a fourth natural response to, to trauma or to fear or to um, situations that you're not, you just, your body naturally reacts, that you don't logically think it through, you just react. And there's that fourth element and that's, I mean, that's how I survived was that appeasement. Um, that's how JC survived. So we were able to have this incredible conversation and so many people in the audience afterwards, they're like, I'd never even heard of that. And it's an opportunity for us to invite, you know, our state legislatures, our policy makers, our business leaders, our, our leaders in the community so that they can come and they can learn and they can hear directly from the source because it's one thing if you, you know, read about it in a book. I mean, books can be incredibly compelling, but when you actually see someone in front of you telling you their story and really live it for you and you can 
have that, I mean, just face to face and almost emotional connection with this person as they're telling you what they experienced and how these actions have influenced the rest of their lives, it makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. And so that's something that, you know, I would have loved to have done on my own, but honestly, I would never have even known where to start. I'd have been like, okay, where should we do it? I don't know. <laughs> there, there, is, there, has, there is a certain percentage of the population who is walking around uh, having experienced sexual trauma uh, and living with the, the emotional consequences of that. How would they be able to access the good that is happening between the Smart and Malou Foundations? Well, we have, so uh, my foundation, we started a podcast. I mean, this is our third season. We're launching at the beginning, end of June. So, I mean, follow us, listen to our podcast. We have amazing people come on, um, just incredible people, you know, survivors, um, therapists, specialists, experts, um, people who are also working in the field trying to make a difference. Um, so that's one way. Follow us across our social media platforms. I mean, me, like my personal page, I'm not the best at posting on. I will just come right out and say that. It's not my favorite thing, but you know, between the Elizabeth Smart Foundation social media, the Maloof Foundation social media, they are, they are up to date and they are current. You know, follow us on, go check out our websites. Um, we have another campaign that is so special to me, probably, probably the most special to me, is one we run every November. It's called We Believe You because I feel like really the difference for me and from what I've learned from other survivors in people's healing is whether or not they feel believed. If they feel like they're believed, they're able to go on and either report it to the police or at least find some help so that they're not carrying it all inside them. But when they aren't believed, then they kind of shut down and they carry it inside them and it can quite literally destroy them from the inside out. You know, they can en end up, you know, in self-harming, they can turn into substance abuse. I mean, it's a really terrible road. And so our November campaign is, I mean, it's really, I want to say, triple-edged, if you will, because we want these survivors to know that we believe them. We invite everyone to, you know, to learn about it, to take a pledge, to take our online pledge. I mean, it's easy, it's not hard, um, but it's just, you know, pledging to support and to love and to listen to survivors. Um, we want our survivors to know that there's a community there for them and that they will be believed. Uh, we want to educate the communities because you are taught so much safety in school. I mean, if you catch on fire, what do you do? Stop, you know, drop and roll. stop, drop and roll. Exactly. When you're about to cross the street, what do you do? Look both ways. Look both ways. Exactly. But what do you do if someone discloses abuse to you? Exactly. Nothing. And the sad truth is, is that about every 70 seconds in America, someone is sexually abused. Every nine minutes, it's a child. So that's a lot of people carrying around a lot of abuse. But this isn't, I mean, I could be wrong, but as far as I know, there's not a person who's stopped dropping and rolling every 70 seconds. I mean, maybe there is. I don't know, Who's keeping but, track? but I haven't come across a yeah. statistic like that, yeah. but we're not really educated on how to respond. And so we want to help educate our communities and our friends and our families to know how to respond. So if someone does disclose to them that they're not just caught like a deer in the headlights thinking, I was not ready for this conversation. What, how am I supposed to respond? And I mean, you're in media, you should know. It's natural to be curious, it's natural to ask questions, but sometimes asking the wrong questions can be so damaging that it once again shuts that person right back down. So it's educating, it's helping support these um, survivors. And then also we have what's called the We Believe You Fund, where all donations that we've taken in during November's and our past campaigns, we've put into our We Believe You Fund, which is basically a fund for survivors that may, there's a lot of wonderful programming out there to help survivors, but sometimes there are things, there are finances that fall through the cracks. This is a fund to help finance those, those expenses that fall through the cracks. Is there a way to measure how much 
good will be done over the coming years from your efforts and the Maloof Foundation's efforts? Is there a way to measure? <sighs> I don't have an answer, shocking, straight off the top of my head, but I would hope that in another 20 years from now that survivors aren't scared to speak out, that they aren't riddled with guilt and shame. Um, I hope that as a community, as a nation, that, uh, frankly globally, I hope that we are a little bit more compassionate and a little bit more supportive of those survivors who come forward and speak out. I hope that we begin to see a shift in numbers because not every rape is a brutal, I mean, I'm not saying, every rape is terrible. And I'm not speaking on behalf of victims currently. I'm like stepping outside of it because some rapes happen when, from someone maybe that you love, a wife or husband, a boyfriend, but the way that they are trying to in, be intimate actually ends up being forced and that is rape. Whereas there are other rapes where it's, you know, brutally Violent. drug into the bushes yeah. and, you know, beaten. And so there is a large gap of education that we can provide and that we can improve upon. And so I think that there is hope that we can see these numbers starting to come down as we educate more, as we speak more, as we, as we move farther into the future. Well, and I guess the, the measurement can only be made uh, in in the lives of the people you touch, you know? Are they able to return to productivity? Are they able to return to their families and loving relationships? Are they able to pattern or model or repeat what you have modeled, you know? That, that I guess, is the big fat question. You've probably thought about this over the last two decades uh, and contemplated it, you know, as you drive quietly from place to place or play with your kids or, you know, spend time with your family. But what would you have been doing now if none of this had happened? I think some of it would be the same. I mean, I'm, I'm a mom and that's what I always wanted to be. I think I'd still be a mom. Um, I would probably still be doing laundry and pulling weeds and making dinner and begging my kids to please make it to the toilet before they pull <laughs> their pants down. <laughs> I imagine much of those, much of my day-to-day, day-to-day, like menial activities would very much be the same. Um, on a bigger scale, I would love to think that I would care as deeply as I do. I would love to think that I would be as involved as I am. but. Honestly, I don't think I would because I would watch the news and I'd be like, that is terrible. How can these terrible things happen in the world? And I'd feel bad about it. And, you know, I'd like if there was a fundraiser going on, I'd probably gladly donate and then I'd go on and live my merry little life. Um, that's honestly what it would be. But my grandpa, he, he, <laughs> not only lived his life this way, but he'd always tell us, he'd, he'd switch it to whatever context we were in in the moment, but he was always do more, say less. And I mean, if we were at the dinner table, he'd tell my brother, one brother in particular, who really liked to talk a lot when he was little, he'd say, eat more, talk less. <laughs> um, but that, I feel like that advice has always um, stuck in my mind. And I've always wanted to be someone who was doing more and talking less. More go and less show. It, it just seems to me that the horrific experience that you went through catapulted you in some perverse way down the spectrum of productivity in terms of helping other people who wind up in that same situation and what a terrible price you had to pay to be able to help so many other people now. Does it ever feel like that to you? Um, I could probably spend all day sitting here like saying it shouldn't have been me. Like, 
I didn't deserve for it to happen. I didn't deserve for that to be my life. But the truth is, is it did happen and it was me. So like it just doesn't really do a whole lot of good dwelling on things I can't change. So I might as well make the most of it. And if something good can come out of it, then good. Well, That's I, what I want. Elizabeth, I dare say that tremendous good because of you and whatever it is inside of you that has driven you forward that have, whether it's what your mom said or your grandpa said or the support system that has been present for you it, whether it's your faith or whatever it has been and maybe it's a combination of all of those things you have done just an astounding job of turning this awful situation into something good that will bless the lives of millions of people who go through something similar. And, and for that, I, I, I don't have the words. I don't have the words. And so thank you on behalf of anyone who winds up needing the the blessing of your advice and your care and your influence in their lives because of what they experience. So uh, we all stand in awe of you. We really, really do. Well, thank you. I certainly feel very blessed. And I mean, I will never stop saying thank you to the people who have loved me and supported me and searched for me and supported my family. Like I will forever be grateful.